Communicating the black male body. Because maleness has come to be understood as synonymous with power and patriarchy and racially codified as white, it has no similar existential content for the black male who, in an anti-black world, is denied maleness and is ascribed as feminine in relation to white masculinity. That is a quote from the man not from my former professor at a and Thomas Curry. So scripting, which is coined by Ronald Jackson, a professor in communication who wrote the book Scripting the Black Masculine Body. Right. So he uses terms like inscription, scripting, scripts, inscriptive, and inscribing. He uses them, he uses them all interchangeably. So they mean that the body is socially understood and treated as a discursive text that is read by interactants, mainly like your body's a blank canvas, and somebody can write on them, type on it, draw on them, and then people read that. So that's script in the body, which is read by outsiders. So let's look at this. There is a hyper-awareness, for example, of the negative inscriptions associated with the black masculine body as criminal, angry, and incapacitated. These scripts are exacerbated by popular cultural portrayals of black males, which make it almost impossible to retrieve custody of the meanings associated with blackness and black males. Because mass media and popular culture are predominantly littered with these negative images, it appears they are unwilling to see black bodies positively, and this affects everyday looking relations. As with any theatrical script, the script is the text, and the act of scripting is the writing of the text. Therefore, to script someone else's body is to actively inscribe or figuratively place oneself, worldview, or ascriptions onto another projected text, which often requires dislocating the original text and redefining the newly affected or mirrored text as the counterpositional or oppositional other. So what does that mean? That's a lot of jargon, it sounds like. Basically, as a producer coming from a different demographic, and I'll be straightforward, white males are the majority of the writers in Hollywood. So they write for other bodies. They write sometimes for Asian bodies, Latino bodies. They write for uh, women, so on and so forth. And they write for African-American bodies. So is their worldview or how they perceive black male bodies. And that's how they inscribe or script those black male bodies, how they see them. So how do they formulate these opinions? So let's look a little bit more. To read the body as text is to interpret its functions, analyze its paraphernalia, and comment on its existence. Scripting is completely diff different paradigm, which presumes that there are social vectors that determine how bodies are inscribed and how scripted roles for foreign bodies are enacted. So the fundamental question is, how do black bodies get scripted in popular media? Fail father. So racist accounts of black males depict them as lesser males who are lazy, unintelligent, aggressive, and violent toward women and children, and who abandon their families physically and cannot provide for them economically. So black men are, if we go to dangerous yet they're victims, black men are all too often vilified because of the color of their skin. Racialized images of black men presented by the media are synonymous with poverty, crime, and a number of other social ills. It can be argued that huge strides have been made to counter these images. The constant images shown by the way of the media serve as daily reminders that the negative depictions of black masculinity still prevail. So a, a need for containing. The stereotypical portrayal of blacks as criminal is political. The politics of race and black masculine identity have produced a peculiar anxiety in the United States. 
This is also evidence in the perception of the black masculine body as a sexual object. All the evidence, well, before we get to that, let's look at this message board poster uh, when Will Smith was going to be named Captain America. This individual, and it's only an individual, but this was the comment. What? No, Captain America must be Caucasian, just like in comics. That is the problem of being politically correct nowadays. Now they want to put a black guy everywhere. I'm not a racist, but even Smith, being a great actor, he should stay away from Captain here. Yes, they did put a black guy to play Nick Fury, the kingpin, and Alicia Masters in the movie, but these are secondary characters. Steve Rogers, Captain America is not. This is messing up with the story. I don't think Marvel Studios would do it. Another one, hashtag. Boycott Star Wars 7. Hashtag warn that the 2015 Star Wars movie promotes white genocide and was made to demoralize and destroy whites. So if other races are getting killed, like in the movie Rwanda, it's okay, even though it's a true de depiction. But we see who's controlling these movies. But they call for a boycott, but the movie still came out. Okay, so we're going to look at non-human animalistics. This is back in slavery. This is when the portrayal start. All the evidence concerning the maltreatment and exploitation of black bodies points to an undeniable conclusion. It was during the period of enslavement that whites developed many of their greatest fears and anxiety toward blacks, particularly toward black males, and established safeguards for rationalizing their vulnerability and unacceptable activities as slave owners. White patriarchal domination and racial supremacist ideology were publicly unquestioned. So let's look at some of the images. We call them controlling images, stereotypical images, the characters that how black folks were viewed in uh, movies or represented in movies early. The Piccaninny, which came to be defined in a dictionary as a negative label for young black child, was indeed played by black children, as in the case of the literary figure, Little Black Sambo. The Piccaninny, like all coon stock types, could be seen on posters, sheet music, cigarette lighters, clothes, so on and so forth. The little character was often shown gaping while holding a watermelon, looking around with overdilated pupils, like this young girl here is depicted. So Uncle Tom, an accommodating, loyal, and faithful servant who wanted nothing more than to exhibit Christian brotherly love in mercy toward others, excuse me. Uncle Tom is used to refer to actually unconscious, culturally unconscious, submissive individual who does not identify, who does not identify with any black community, but instead prefers to see himself as white identified, culturalist, raceless, independent American citizen who can achieve the American dream without attaching himself to a black community as long as he has God. So then we'll look at the coon. He was cheerful and contented individual who was loved by whites for his complacent faithfulness and unquestionable loyalty to whites. A buffoon is the, the jokester. Like today, it would be Kevin Hart in some of his movies, Michael Epps. Um, blacks that are put on television for purely entertainment and to make people laugh like back in the days it was amos and andy and this character here jj from uh, good times now that's way back in the 70s your parents probably know about these television shows uh, but you can look them up and so then we have the magical negro it's a supporting stock character who comes to the aid 
of the white protagonist in films. Magical Negro characters who often possess special insight or mystical powers have long been a tradition in American film, like the uh, American film, excuse, excuse me, like the Green Mile, the Legend of Bagger Vance, right here, um, and also Rudy. So then we have the Buck or the Brute. The Buck's primary objective was raping white women. He essentially refused to even attempt to control his insatiable sexual desires and urges. Hence, the black body of the brute was scripted to be nothing less than an indiscreet, devious, irresponsible, and sexually pernicious beast. This character explicitly showcased two major fears or anxiety of white men. First, theft of his woman by a maniacal, hedonist, and inherently violent black male body and second the possibility that she might you know be excited by his sexual nature and accept him despite his flaws <clears throat> so that's the whole myth of black males with the gigantic penis and black males who are hypersexual and who are who are way better at sex they're depicted in in television and film this way as over sex you hear it in music a lot in hip-hop you're like wow there's a lot of sexual references in in hip-hop music so this goes to these characters you don't know you might know mike tyson jack johnson was like the first black heavyweight champion he's actually from texas then there's a, there was a period in the 70s called black Ploit, black exploitation films so this goes all the way to darren wilson um and he states I felt like a five-year-old holding on to Hulk Hogan, he said in his testimony to the grand jury. That's just how big he felt and how small I felt. Wilson said the only way he could describe Brown's intense, aggressive face was that it looked like a demon. He feared for his life. So this is the Mike Brown case in, in Ferguson. So lynching as a popular culture an act of containment this is how black bodies was controlled through violence through lynching right so i'm not going to read this whole thing but this is if you, when you get the slide you can look at it i'll keep it on here for a second um it's grotesque um, but this talks about how a man in, in uh, april 24th 1899 was burnt at a stake right where so let's go through some of the photos we see Upper left-hand corner, you can see the guy to a tree, chained and burned. Two men hung from a tree. Uh, two men hung from a pole, one on the ground dead, and then another one burnt at a stake here. And people are watching. There's an audience. People used to pay to see lynchings and burnings. They would uh, get tickets. Um uh, souvenirs and postcards were made and people would put on their Sunday best or dress up to go see these lynchings and these killings. So this is diabolical in nature. And you see people around there taking pictures like, look what we've done, men and women. So, so here on the left, you have black males getting beat up. This was in Selma. And then all the way fast forward to Ferguson police. So this still goes on today. But in this lecture, because of how black bodies are scripted in Hollywood, right, it has a carryover on how people treat black male, male bodies when they see them, when they see them in stores, uh, when they see them on the road, when they see them in the street, how cops treat them. This triggers like racial profiling and also um, stop and frisk laws because the black body is scripted and depicted as a miscreant. So that's all for this lecture. Um, I will post this and I will get started on the black female body.